disclosures for that. Um, none of them are really directly relevant to this and not really a conflict of interest. Um, so every conversation about adult congenital heart disease has to explain why you're actually listening to this and why do you actually care, because isn't it a niche population? Well, so we'll talk about why this is not just a niche issue anymore. And then we'll talk, um, we'll start off with um, talking about the complicated issues, I'm sorry, the frequent issues that you deal with with complicated congenital heart disease. And then we'll back up a little bit and actually talk about a basic framework for how to understand adult congenital heart disease. And we'll talk about some specific examples of the things that we often deal with and that ever-present question, what are you looking for? So why, why do we think this is an important thing and why are you all here and why am I occupying an hour of your time? Well, so this is what we in the field actually think that the population looks like and why is that the case? Well, it turns out that 1% of every live birth is, um, has a congenital heart defect. And the issue that at the end of the day is in 1953 with the first cardiopulmonary bypass, which by the way, that case was what? Cardiopulmonary bypass was done for? Correct. There were actually people on Twitter who actually thought it was for car, um, coronary artery bypass grafting, which clearly it wasn't done back then. So, um, so that was the advent of survival for adult congenital, for congenital heart disease, right? And so obviously in 1944 with the Blaylock, Tausig, Thomas Shunt, there was an advent before that of patients being palliated and surviving. But obviously, as you know, with a shunt, you develop major complications from that over time. So ultimately, you need some sort of definitive repair. But then what we see is a pattern of every successive time after that, we have a whole generation of patients that are surviving to adulthood for the very first time. And with the most recent being hypoplastic left heart being conquered, if you will. So these kids are all making it to adulthood. So a child born with congenital heart disease today has a more than 90% likelihood of surviving to adulthood. And so now you can see why we are going to start to see a major um, bolus of these patients. And it actually is reflected in the admissions to the hospital. So in dark gray, these are admissions to the hospital um, for congenital heart disease in the adult, and in light grade, these are pediatric admissions with congenital heart disease. And if you think about it, unlike most of what we deal with in cardiology, this is lifetime exposure. So the moment you are born, you have this disease. So you can imagine that the burden on the healthcare system is so much more than that. So one way of thinking of it is the following. If the pediatricians have these patients for 18 years, we have them for potentially three times the length of that afterwards. And so in one way of thinking about it, if these patients make it, we have every reason to believe so, we may actually have a population that's three times the size of the pediatric cardiology population. And that's reflected by the fact that by next year, we should see 2.2 million adults with congenital heart disease in the United States. So um, before we move on, let's go ahead and do a quick pretest. Um, so can we switch over to that? Awesome. Okay, so um, I guess first of all, we actually have to get everybody to sign up for Poll Everywhere. So, um, so everybody pull out your phones. I know you already did because you were born by my initial slides about the prevalence of congenital heart disease. So pull out your phones, come on. Put your pizza down for a second, pull out your phone. All fellows, these are different questions. So 37607, right? I promise you these will not be boring questions. Okay, every... Let's see. Let me look and see. Which times did you get a response? You all set to go? Everybody, anybody still working on it? Sweet. All right, let's do it. First question, please. All right. This transposition of the great arteries atrial switch is performed with bovine pericardium and is more often complicated by atrial baffle leak and stenosis. The mustard procedure or the sending procedure? Mustard procedure is A, sending procedure is B. Go. Oh, and they're off. I guess I'll do the countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. Anybody feel strongly about the answer and want to say something? 
Nobody, okay, all right. Well, 80% of people are correct, so it is the mustard procedure. So the mustard procedure is typically made out of heterologous material, typically bovine pericardium. And so you can imagine if it's done when you're two, three, four years of age, it doesn't grow with you. And so it tends to have more issues with baffle leak or stenosis and transposition. Whereas the sending, a much more complicated procedure is actually done with the autologous atrial tissue. And so it grows with the child. Let's go to the next question. You guys are doing great. Okay, complications of transposition of the great arteries with arterial switch typically consist of, number one, pulmonic valve regurgitation, right ventricular enlargement, and VT. Number two, coronary artery kinking, neoaortic dilation, and regurgitation. Get your answers in. There's no reason to abstain. Nobody really knows that you get it wrong, so it's okay. Usually count down 10, nine, Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. So um, the first answer, what is that typically seen in? Anybody? I heard somebody. Tetralogy. Very good. Tetralogy flow with its initial repair. Number two, coronary artery kinking, neoaortic dilation, and regurgitation. This is typically what you see when you do the arterial switch because you actually have the neoaorta composed out of pulmonary uh, valvular tissue, right? Or sorry, pulmonary root tissue. Also, the coronaries are reimplanted, and so therefore, just as with every other neonatal coronary reimplantation surgery, you can have kinking of it. Um, and then, of course, because it's made of pulmonic tissue, you have dilation of the annulus and ultimately potentially regurgitation. So this is something that you always need to look for when you have the transposition with arterial switch. Next question. All right, if you need a second, uh, Abu and I can keep going. All right, so all right, that's okay. Take a break, we'll keep moving. All right, so um, oftentimes our patients will present with quote unquote transposition, but transposition um, can hide a bunch of other things. And so the, the visual that I was actually gonna show you is the idea of the slot machine, right? So with um, complex congenital heart disease, they can have one, two, three, four, five issues. In this particular situation, this is a patient who has actually quote unquote transposition, but one of my patients, they actually have all of the following. They have, of course, totally ambiguous sightedness. Um, she has dextrocardia, common atrium, complete AV canal. Of course, she has actually really malpositioned the great arteries because they're really not transposed on anything at, anymore at this point since she has single ventricle physiology. She has pulmonic stenosis, bilateral superior vena cava, um, bilateral hepatic venous drainage, absent hepatic segment of the inferior vena cava, and as is continuation of the right SVC, right? So, so why, why are all these things really an issue? So let's actually talk about single ventricle palliation. So um, this is sort of the poster child for, um, for our issues. Um, this, we're gonna start off with just keeping it simple and talk about a hypoplastic right sort of situation. Um, and this is uh, a typical situation where you have, um, where you have mal uh, development of the right ventricle. So as you can see here, um, what, you're, what you're born with is the following. You have to have an atrial septal defect because you have to have mixing of the pulmonary venous blood and the systemic venous blood because they're all going to go into the common atrium, which necessitates a VST. I'm sorry, uh, common atrium and then the common ventricle, which necessitates a VST, right? So basically, if you can imagine your blue blood is coming in from your SVC and your IVC, it has to mix in the common atrium with the pulmonary venous circulation, which is the red blood, and then it has to go into a ventricle that has some sort of ventricular septal defect so that that way you can actually get the purple blood going out into the aorta and the pulmonary artery, okay? So if the aorta is small, um, which may be in certain situations, then you actually get some of your flow coming retrograde through the pulmonary artery and through the patent ductus arteriosus, which is why sometimes you see patients show up on day five to seven of life if they don't have some sort of prenatal diagnosis. Why? Anybody know why they show up at day five to seven of life? Correct. The PDA closes, they get really super sick and cyanotic, and then they show up emergently. And then the neonatologist immediately starts the prostaglandins with a bolus infusion 
opens up the PDA, you start getting flow again, okay? So the idea is this, you can't live off of the PDA, right? So the first thing that you have to do is create your own PDA of some kind. And then the idea is if you only have one ventricle that's going to do all of the work, you want to preferentially have the ventricle pump to which organs? Anybody? Go ahead. Okay, nobody else is volunteering, so. Which are your most vital organs for this baby? Heart and brain, correct. So you have to get your, um, your maximum blood flow to your coronary arteries and um, and your, uh, your head and neck vessels, right? So the idea is that you have to augment the, aorta, the ascending aorta as much as possible from that single ventricle, whether it's a single left ventricle or a single right ventricle. What you don't want is you don't want, because of lower pulmonary vascular resistance, you don't want the preferential blood flow to go out the pulmonary artery, okay? Because you currently have both trunks, both the aorta and the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary artery coming off of this single ventricle system, okay? And if, you're, um, if they're both connected, that means that you're gonna have preferential blood flow to the lungs because you have a lower pulmonary vascular resistance. So what you do is you take down your pulmonary artery coming off the single ventricle and you give blood flow another way. Steve. There are, it's all a spectrum, okay? So typically tricuspid atria, yeah, you have really no functional right ventricle. Many times you'll see this sort of thing where you have a bulbo ventricle, um, and the size of your ventricle is very variable, okay? So the issue is at the end of the day, when you're making a decision about whether or not you can septate the child and take them down to two ventricle repair versus a single ventricle repair, really depends on the size and the three components of the right ventricle. If you don't have a right, the correct size right ventricle by a certain Z-score, and you don't have a tripartite right ventricle, that's probably not a kid who's going to support a two ventricular repair. Uh, I hope that answers your question. And you can see any variation, any, any degree of that spectrum. No, not necessarily. You can have it from pulmonary atresia, you can have it from tricuspid atresia, you can have it from some combination thereof, okay? Um, there are other, other issues with that as well. Sometimes you can have it with complete AV canal, where the, um, where the AV canal is directed towards one direction or the other, and you can have a left dominant AV canal or a right dominant AV canal as well. Um, many, many different variations that get you sort of the same place, and probably want to not spend too much time on that, because a lot of times by the time they get to us, they're already down the single ventricle pathway. But that's the bottom line. Sometimes you will see patients who have a decent sized right ventricle and they've gone down the single ventricle pathway, and then you know, you have to think back to why, why do they go that pathway. So bottom line is this. So they have to take the connection off of the single ventricle to the pulmonary artery, and then you have to provide blood flow to the pulmonary vascular system somehow, right? So initially it's through a PDA. What is our way of actually making a mechanical PDA? I'll give you a hint. It was done in 1944 for the first time. BT shunt, that's right. So traditionally now, the, um, the BT shunt is still the pathway that, um, that is taken for their additional palliation, okay? So, another, so to summarize, okay, you get your pulmonary arterial blood flow primarily through some sort of shunt, okay, either primarily BT shunt. Um, typically nowadays, it's not actually made out of the arterial tissue, it's made out of a Gore-Tex graft, so you have a calibrated amount of blood flow going to the lungs. Number two, your single ventricle is um, uh, the priority of its flow is going to your ascending aorta, and so therefore your coronary arteries as well as your head and neck vessels, okay? But that's not something that's gonna last for very long, right? You can't actually leave the child that way, okay? So ultimately what ends up happening, oops, excuse me for a second. So ultimately what ends up happening um, is the next stage. So the idea at this point is that you wanna provide a little bit more of a sort of, um, um, a situation where that single ventricle doesn't just doesn't pump to both the pulmonary arterial circulation as well as the um, the systemic ar um, arterial circulation, right? So what you do then is you take down that BT shunt or other shunt that you have, and you take the pulmonary arteries and you hook them up to the systemic venous circulation through the SVC. Okay, and so this is called the Glenn shunt. Um, the IVC uh, venous return continues to return to your common atrium and common ventricular circulation, right? So the child will still be blue, okay? But you're taking down some of the uh, systemic venous return to the single ventricle, okay? And this is commonly known as a one and a half ventricle solution because you're still, um, you're still um, um, some of the uh, venous return is still returning to the single ventricle, okay? 
So then the final stage of this is called the Fontan. And there are many different versions of the Fontan. We'll talk about um, the pluses and minuses each of that. Um, but the bottom line is uh, the goal of this is to take the IVC venous return and hook it up to the pulmonary arterial circulation. And so now what you have is you have complete venous return going to the pulmonary arterial circulation without an intervening ventricle. Okay? And the idea now is then that the systemic single, single ventricle, all it has to do is pump blood flow to the arterial circulation. Okay, so obviously this is not a perfect solution, right? Obviously if we could survive off of one ventricle, that's the way we'd be born, but here are some issues, right? So obviously if, um, if they have a hypoplastic left heart and they're left with a single systemic right ventricle, then they're, they're gonna be prone to developing right side, I'm uh, sorry, they're gonna be prone to developing systolic heart failure, especially once they start developing AV valve regurgitation. But one of the issues you can imagine is that they're going to chronically have an elevation in their systemic venous pressures, right? Because there is no intervening ventricle, there is no AV valve, okay? And so their systemic venous pressures are going to be continuously elevated. It can be as elevated as 18, 20 millimeters of mercury. Possibly in some patients we've seen as high as the 30s, okay? So obviously you're going to see a problem where you start to leak protein into the gut. The other major thing that you're going to see is, of course, liver failure. So many of these patients, and some people even think from the time of the initial Fontan surgery, these patients actually start to develop changes in the liver architecture, and they're at risk of cirrhosis and even hepatocellular carcinoma. So every Fontan patient needs an evaluation for Fontan-associated liver disease. So, and then finally, of course, because um, in their past they were chronically cyanotic, Many of these patients will actually have bronchial collaterals, and they may, be, they may persist even into adulthood, and they may actually be at risk of hemoptysis. They often develop other collaterals, too, that we typically call aortopulmonary collaterals um, as well. So these are the three different types of Fontan uh, um, uh, palliations. And so the first one was the true Fontan Kreutzer, which was done in 1971. So the idea is sort of this natural conclusion in the patient who has tricuspid atresia. And the idea is that if you have tricuspid atresia and you have no right ventricle, let's just bypass the right ventricle completely by just hooking up the right atrial appendage directly to the pulmonary arterial circulation. Okay, it's a one-stop shop. So we still have patients like this. So the patients who are repaired here um, in the 1980s, uh, or I should say palliated in the 1980s here in Houston, typically got an atrial pulmonary fontan. Later on, in the, um, in the latter part of the 1980s, um, there was the development of the lateral tunnel fontan. And the idea of the lateral tunnel fontan is you're going to take some of that um, right atrial tissue, and then you're going to baffle around it with either a Gore-Tex or pericardium so that you create a conduit within the uh, right atrium. Um, and you separate the, that part of the right atrium and divert that blood flow directly to the pulmonary arterial circulation from the rest of your common atrium. What this allows for is you can create continuity by creating a fenestration between your fontan and your common atrium. So that way you can decompress the fontan by allowing that right to left shunting, okay? And so what that allows for is if initially after the surgery the fontan pressures are too high, and I'll show a case of that in a minute, you can actually have decompression through that quote unquote fenestration. The problem on the other hand is if you leave the fenestration and you develop a DVT, you can be subject to cryptogenic stroke or other paradoxical embolism. And then finally, in, the 19, in 1990, with the development of the extracardiac fontan, uh, extracardiac conduit, which is um, basically taking Gore-Tex or other type of graft material and directly connecting the IVC to the SVC and PA um, system. So let's talk about why this is potentially an issue. So this is a case that I did when I was a fellow um, at St. Louis Children's. So she's a three-year-old who came in for her Fontan conversion from Glenn, okay? So her initial hemodynamics were excellent. Um, her Fontan procedure went uncomplicated and went actually very well, but she came back with high chest drainage and low cardiac output state. So when we took her to the cath lab, this is what we saw. And so when we chronically get asked the question, when you're looking at a Fontan patient, what are you looking for? This is one of the things that we really want to make sure is not going on. So what are we looking at here, anybody? What's the problem? So let's start off, let's start off by may, um, going through what's actually happening. So these are the hepatic veins, right? This is the IVC. This is the Fontan itself. This is the connection of the Fontan to the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. So what do we see here? 
the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. Yeah, they're stenotic, right? They're stenotic on both sides. And so this is commonly a problem that we often see. And it, any kind of stenosis or any kind of barrier to flow from the fontan into the pulmonary circulation is going to create a problem. Because remember, there's no ventricle, right? So if you have a two to three millimeter gradient going across that, that may actually be really a problem for these patients. And so the first thing that we did was we went ahead and stented this, right? And so ultimately, this is what it looked like after we stented it. Right, so we fixed this issue, and probably in this um, patient who's a couple of days out of the surgery, it's probably because the fontan was potentially too long and kinking the pulmonary arteries. All right, so, so she goes on to do okay, but then she continues to have problems thereafter. So she remains intubated um, and has continued portocardic output, elevated venous pressures, and continued chest tube output three days later after the intervention. So what are we going to do at this point in time? Well, so we've already looked. Her pulmonary arterial um, uh, circulation should look pretty good, right? So this is a lateral shot of her Fontan circulation, okay? And then this is where the common atrium would be, okay? And so you can see there's no connection there, okay? So that's where fenestration may actually be helpful. So she's continuing to put out chest tube output because she's got a high systemic venous pressure because she's not tolerating this initial Fontan palliation, right? And so what do we do? We go ahead and plan to make a fenestration. So th the first thing that we do is we puncture across it um, from the fontan into the common atrium. You can see as we inject contrast in the common atrium, that's what it looks like. And then we start stenting there, okay? So we flare the stent on the, um, on the common atrial side. And then ultimately, this is what it looks like. So now we've created continuity between the fontan and then the common atrium, okay? So we are sacrificing um, her sats. So her systemic sats are now going to be low. They're gonna be in the probably mid 80s. Okay, however, we're gonna decompress that Fontan circulation and hopefully get her extubated and have less of that chest tube output. So the concept is ultimately this, right? So we have our systemic venous circulation coming across and then we have our common atrium with our pulmonary venous circulation coming in. And the idea is we're gonna create a hole from our Fontan into the common atrium so that we have mixing. And the idea is that with this, we have some purple blood going into the systemic uh, ventricle and going out to the systemic circulation. But the idea, is that you only have passive venous blood flow going through the Fontan circulation. And if you have any degree of elevation in the pulmonary vascular resistance, that's going to really create problems and then have severely elevated venous uh, pressures. So if you can create a fenestration that allows connection between your Fontan and your common atrium, that ultimately allows you to decompress the Fontan, decompress your systemic venous pressures, and allows also to have a little bit better forward cardiac output through your systemic circulation. But the cost is, of course, that the sats are going to be low, and you're also going to have a right to left shunt that could potentially lead ultimately to uh, a paradoxical embolism. Yes. So you're, you're asking, could you potentially instead have left to right shunting? Is that what you're asking? So you're having common atrial shunting into the, so red blood going to the blue blood side? Is that what you're asking? Right, so two things. Number one, you need to know what the common atrial pressure is before you poke a hole, okay? And if there's no gradient, if the fontan pressure is lower than the common atrial pressure, you better know what you're doing. You better have a good reason for doing that, right? And that actually may be beneficial. That's pretty rare. That You can imagine a situation where you have severe diastolic dysfunction of the common systemic ventricle, which could elevate your common atrial pressure, and you may want to decompress that. But I have to say that's pretty rare because, you know, basically it's reflected all the way into your Fontan circulation. So if you have an elevation in your common atrial pressure, you're probably gonna have a very high pressure in your Fontan as well. So that's pretty rare, but I can imagine a situation there where that might actually happen. Good question. Other questions before we go on? Okay, great. So you wanna switch over to our questions real quick? So this is really more of a post question now. Maybe, maybe not. Sweet. Okay, so this, you guys should all know the answer to this now. 
So fenestration of a fontan, which is performed to decompress the fontan at the cost of systemic desaturation right to left shunt, generally describes a connection between the, one, SBC and pulmonary artery, two, IVC and fontan, and common atrium. Come on, everybody, jump in. So I'll count down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, good. So, so hopefully I'm a relatively effective teacher. Okay, so all right, let's move on to our next question. Oh, oh somebody's trying to answer. <laughs> somebody's just trying to spite me. <laughs> okay, all right. So. This one, we, we're probably not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about, but um, this, is, uh, this is actually gonna be covered at ACC 2020 this year. There's gonna be actually a whole session on the congenital heart disease pathway on heterotaxy. And as the fellows know, we did transplant a heterotaxy patient this year, so it's not gonna be beyond the likelihood that you're gonna see it. So a heterotaxy patient should be evaluated for the following issues. Interrupted IVC, abdominal organ, uh, abnormal abdominal organ solitus, uh, anomalous pulmonary venous connection and ciliary disorders. Number two, parachute mitral valve aortic stenosis coarctation. Come on, everybody, get your answer in. You don't lose anything. And All right, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Okay, very good. You guys did great. All right, so what's number two? Schoen's complex. Very good. Excellent. All right, let's go to our next question. So I will say this, actually. Correct. Yes. Yes, but then unfortunately that makes our, our question person who has to put it on the slide work harder. So, All right, you are asked to evaluate a hypoplastic left heart patient who has undergone heart transplant. What are you concerned about in the evaluation of this patient? In other words, what are you looking for? Number one, distal pulmonary arterial stenosis, hypoplastic left lung. Number two, aortic arch abnormalities or coarctation of the aorta. Come on, everybody, get your answers in. So you can see the reason why I'm asking these two questions, right, is the fact that these issues persist even after transplant. There's this common concept that once you transplant the heart, Everything's fine. Well, unfortunately, that's not actually true, right? If you have ciliary dyskinesis associated with heterotaxy, that's still there even after you transplant the heart. Wow. Okay. And that, honestly, I think that's my fault because typically in this, in this lecture, I cover hypoplastic left heart specifically. Okay, so, so the bottom line is this. With hypoplastic left, hypoplastic left heart, and actually with most of our other lesions that ultimately lead you to transplantation, you do have to be aware that there are great vessel abnormalities that continue to persist afterwards. So with hypoplastic left heart, one of the issues that they typically deal with is um, aortic atresia, okay? And so the arch can be abnormal, there can be a coarctation, there can be ascending aortic abnormalities. In fact, the ascending aorta is commonly not even the ascending anymore because with hypoplastic left heart palliation in, during the initial Norwood, you actually have to do a side-to-side -side anastomosis with the pulmonary arterial trunk. So the, the neo-ascending aorta is actually typically composed of the ascending aorta plus the pulmonary trunk. And then oftentimes you actually have to do an arch reconstruction. So if you're going to transplant these patients or if you're gonna treat these patients, you do, oh look, <laughs> Yeah, too late. You do need to look at the aortic arch and the entire, actually really the entire length of the aorta. Okay, let's do one more and then we'll keep going. Okay, a patient presents with dextrocardia and SATs in the high 80s and your echo suggests large VSD, two ventricles, one of which is really small, the AV valves are at the same level and reported PA pressure of 90. What else should you look for? Number one, nothing. The patient has Isominger, there's nothing else to look for. Number two, subcostal outflow tract sweeps, other posterior vascular structures. Bonus points if you tell me what you're talking about. Super bonus points if you can find the, my pet peeve in the stem of the question. Fellows should know this. <laughs> 
this is for all of you stenographers out there. This is, this is a typical issue that we're dealing with. So what's my pet peeve in the stem of the question? Fellows. So, so, from the interventional standpoint, yes, that's, we'll, come up, we'll come back to that later. In the stem of the question, you estimate what when you look at RV systolic pressure. Never say that you're estimating the PA pressure when you're looking at a congenital heart patient, especially not somebody who has dextrocardia and a VSD, okay? Because you can't, unless you know that there's no right ventricular outflow tract or pulmonic outflow tract obstruction, you have no idea what the pulmonary arterial pressures are. And we've told you nothing about that. So what are we talking about here? Anybody know? I mentioned it actually earlier. So this is one of your pathways to actually having a single ventricle physiology. Any guesses? Valves at the same level. AV valves at the same level. Suggest what? Complete AV canal. One ventricle is smaller than the other. So that's your unbalanced AV canal, okay? And so of course, of course your AV valve gradient is gonna be 90, right? I mean, that's your systemic to common atrium gradient, right? That's not your pulmonary pressure at all because this patient is what? What's the posterior vascular structure we're looking for? We just spent all the time talking about the three different types, I think. Fontan. So you got this gigantic round thing sitting behind the atrium when you're doing your four chamber view. What is that, right? That's your fontan, okay? So you should be looking for a couple of things, right? Number one, we really need to know the great artery connections, right? Because then you can actually tell, is it transposed? Are they malposed, right? And you will actually also see that there's discontinuity between the right ventricle or whatever structure it is, whatever ventricle structure it is with the pulmonary artery. But if you don't show us that, we have no idea what's going on. And we're liable to think, number one, that this is Eisenmenger with a big VSD, okay? So when you see this, sonographers, we need to see those subcostal sweeps where you show us the outflow tracks, okay? If you don't show us that connection to the outflow track, we don't know which one's which. You're not gonna see the coronary arteries in adults, right? So don't bother looking for the coronary arteries to show you which one's the aorta, but you need to show us the, um, the sweeps, okay? All right, um, so let's move on. Can we switch back to the slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay, <laughs> I agree, I agree. <laughs> if it were easy. <laughs> All right, so what are you looking for? That's the typical question. So sometimes we do these CT scans and the reason why we're actually doing it is because we're actually going to do fusion. So um, for those of you guys who actually came to my research conference, we talked a lot about 3D, 3D fusion and 2D, 3D fusion. So um, I didn't actually show this slide, this is really important. So the reason why this becomes really critical is we can take a 3D data set from CT and then the 3D data of the patient on the table and then all we really need to do is register the two pieces of information together and then what that allows us then to do is whenever we move the table or we, um, or we rotate the, um, the C arm, our 3D data set from the CT scan moves with it. So we have two ways of registering. The first one is actually doing 3D, 3D and I'll show an example of that in, con um, in conjunction with actually topping out a left-sided obstruction. So um, as Anusha pointed out, we have things called Schoen's complex, right? And so um, as with all other congenital heart lesions, if you have one lesion, you need to start looking for all the others that are potentially associated with it. And when you talk about left-sided obstruction, it can certainly involve the mitral, it can involve the subvalvular aortic apparatus, the valvar, um, supervalvar, um, and then coarctation. Of course, middle aortic syndrome is something we have to often look for as well. So if you have any, especially the left-sided lesions, you need to look for any of the other areas being involved as well, including those who have been transplanted, right? So um, this is sort of our typical issue, right? So coarctation, right? Um, this is actually more than just coarctation. This is actually total interruption. I think the fellows have seen this case before. So in coarctation of the aorta, right, we need to look for secondary hypertension, differential blood pressure between the upper extremities and lower extremities. Unfortunately, um, as I showed you at research conference, um, fixed is never truly fixed when it comes to coarctation of the aorta. And oftentimes these patients are subject to developing um, aortic aneurysms or other arterial um, aneurysms uh, related to the aortop uh, their arteriopathies. They can develop cerebral aneurysms, so they all require some one-time cerebral uh, imaging. Um, and then really, most of these patients are probably going to require some sort of CT or MR imaging serially to evaluate for the development of thoracic aortic aneurysm or aneurysm of their um, repair. 
And then finally, many of these patients are subject to, uh, um, to having actually bicuspid aortic valve underlying as well. Some people actually think that these patients are more likely to develop coronary um, atherosclerotic or atherosclerotic disease as well because they're chronic hypertension, right? They've been exposed to hypertension probably their entire lives. And even after repair of the coarctation, they may continue to have um, uh, uh, hypertension even late in life. So um, let me show you a little bit from this um, aortic interruption case. So this is a case that I took to cath lab initially, and thankfully I didn't try to do anything because there's a complete interruption, as you can see here. Um, so what we ended up doing is we did a rotational angiography on the table, okay, and this created a CT data set that allows to have 3D imaging. Um, and then we use this 3D imaging to, uh, 3D data set to actually perforate across. And so what we're using is RF perforation um, energy, a rate of frequency perforation energy to perforate all the way through. And we're going from the, um, from the descending limb to the proximal limb of the, um, of the interruption. And then at that point, it's just interventional techniques where we snare out the wire, and then we cross it, um, and then we'll go ahead and put a covered stent across it. And this is what it looks like once we're done. So the issue, of course, is this is not the end of the story, right? So at the end of the day, we need to continue following these patients for their valvular issues, right? Because this patient, of course, has a bicuspid aortic valve, no surprise. Um, but when you see these patients who potentially have some variant of Schoen's complex, you do need to look at their mitral valve as well. You do need to look at their aortas as well. Um, and then, of course, all, all patients should be assessed for um, cerebral aneurysms. So let's move on to right-sided um, lesions. Um, and so, of course, in right-sided lesions, they can involve either the tricuspid, the subvalvular PS, PS itself, supervalvular PS, which can even involve the branch pulmonary arteries. And in some situations, we can actually even see distal um, and peripheral pulmonary arterial stenoses. So, of course, the uh, poster child for this is tetralogy flow, right? So, um, for those of you who don't remember all the issues that come with tetralogy flow, typically, <laughs> with the one exception in the last seven years, we will not see unrepaired tetralogy flow. Every so often we do get it, we have gotten it. We have actually done a complete tetralogy flow repair here at this institution during my tenure. So for those of you who don't remember, um, it's typically a right ventricular flow tract obstruction and a VSD, right? So the right ventricular flow tract obstruction involves what, fellows? Come on, I heard it, somebody say something. Infant, well, you're not a fellow anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, infundibular stenosis, which is, which is typically muscular. And so when I, was a, when I was a medical student, I didn't really understand why do we care about right ventricular hypertrophy as one of the four tetralogy flow issues, right? And the reason why is because the, way, the longer you wait to repair these kids, the more infundibular obstruction you get because the RV uh, muscles get hypertrophied, right? So that increases your obstruction. So you get this sort of um, um, circle where things continue to get worse. You also typically have pulmonic valve annulus um, that's small, okay? So you can't just, you know, remove the muscle bundles and then hope that everything's going to go well. So the surgeon typically has to actually slice across the pulmonic valve annulus and augment the size, especially because most of the time they're trying to do these less than one year of age at this point. And so you can imagine if you slice across the pulmonic valve annulus and you patch it, you're going to need what? Come on, fellas. You guys should all be able to do this automatically. Who answered that question at the very beginning? I got that right. Correct. So eventually, you're going to need a pulmonic valve replacement because they're all going to have pulmonic regurgitation. So we think, based upon recent data, that um, tetralogy flow patients who've had their initial repair, about 90-something percent of them are going to need a pulmonic valve replacement. When is that timing? Well, that's still subject of investigation. We don't really know. But what does it actually look like? So this is my favorite patient. Probably everyone has actually heard about this guy at this point in time. Um, so he's working. Um, he's actually a field engineer. He builds race cars um, and does mixed martial arts for his hobbies. And he was dragged into the office um, by his wife and his mom um, uh, because they thought maybe he should see a doctor since he hasn't seen one for 18 years. So he caught, he's on his way out the door, says he's got no symptoms, and sure, he shouldn't because he's doing mixed martial arts, right? But he says he does have occasional palpitations. So I slap an event monitor onto him, and this is what we get the very next day, right? So this is why we don't really want to wait until you're in the mid-30s to do that initial pulmonic valve replacement because this is what your uh, cardiac MRI is going to look like. So for those of you who are not familiar, this is the right ventricle, okay? This is the right ventricle output tract such as it is. You can see there's just really to and fro flow through the uh, pulmonic out outflow. And you can see how the right ventricle enlargement has really um, started compressing on the left ventricle, um, both with systolic and diastolic. Um, so um, obviously at this point in time, the guy needs a pulmonic valve replacement. He undergoes a bioprosthetic pulmonic valve replacement. He's discharged on day five and does great. 
But obviously the problem at the end of the day is this, right? So he's 36 years of age. His pulmonic valve is probably going to last him maybe 15 years if we're lucky. So he's probably going to need another pulmonic valve replacement around 50 years of age, right? So that's where transcatheter valve technology has really been helpful. So many people actually don't know that the Melody valve, which is this, um, was actually the first transcatheter valve technology that was invented in first in, uh, first in man. So um, it's a bovine jugular um, venous valve, okay, that's actually sewn onto a platinum meridian stent and introduced on a balloon catheter from the femoral venous access site. The Edwards uh, valve has also now been approved for, uh, for the pulmonic uh, position as well. Uh, and so we typically use either of those depending on the context of the situation. You can see how it's being deployed in a previously placed pul um, prosthetic pulmonic valve. So sometimes we have to get clever about this. Um, but the bottom line is this. So in Tetralogy Flow, they're gonna say that they're asymptomatic because they really don't know any different anyway, right? So they were born with congenital heart disease. They don't know what normal is. So they can't really tell you that they're normal, right? So um, most of them are gonna need a pulmonic valve replacement after the initial repair. So if they've only had one surgery, they're almost guaranteed to have a pulmonic regurgitation. They're almost guaranteed to need another um, surgery. If they don't get it done, or even if they do get it done, they may still be at risk of uh, ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. The other more rare issue that we need to look at um, in these patients is aortic root aneurysm and the development of, of aortic regurgitation. Um, the bottom line is this. These are our frequent flyers. These are the patients that we need to continue to evaluate and we really need to have in congenital clinic for a lifetime. So um, I'm gonna skip through this. Um, so the reason why I bring up this in particular is because I really wanna sort of talk about why um, the CT scans what we do preoperatively for our interventions is so critical in these patients. So when we do these CT scans, we're typically actually going to fuse the data into the cath lab. And so what you're looking at here is, um, is fluoroscopy with the CT data. So the, the CT data is in pink, and the fluoroscopy obviously is in, um, in, in gray. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do 2D, 3D fusion. So instead of using the rotational angiography that I showed you earlier, we're just gonna take two views in fluoroscopy, and that will actually allow us to take the CT data set and fuse it to the patient on the table. So we're using a combination of the bony landmarks and external wires, as well as catheters in certain vascular structures to fuse the data. And so once we do that, we can actually take this data set that's on the left with this very complicated anatomy and fuse it right onto the patient here. Okay, and, and what that allows us to do is actually draw these ranges of interest, help direct the actual intervention, um, which can really reduce the amount of contrast, the amount of um, uh, fluoroscopy that we use for these cases. And so this is what it looks like when we actually implement it. And you can actually see the melody valve implanted into um, that pulmonic allulus that's been drawn from the CT scan. So um, we're gonna go full circle at this point and come back to transposition. I think um, Dr. Naga asked specifically to go over this. So between you and me, this is actually what actually got me into congenital heart disease in the first place. So um, my first exposure to transposition was actually as a second year fellow and I had no idea what I was facing because we actually didn't have congenital heart patients um, at the um, internal medicine residency program that I trained at. So this is my first exposure. So transposition of the great arteries, also known as detransposition, also known as complete transposition, comes out of the box sick. So in other words, the minute they're born, they're in trouble. So this is why, right? So the blue blood goes through the right heart into the aorta. That's what transposition of the great arteries means. Goes through the systemic circulation and comes back bluer into the SVC and IVC and back to the right heart, okay? Likewise, the left ventricle pumps the pulmonary arterial circulation. So you've got the red blood going in the lungs, goes through the pulmonary circulation, and comes back redder back to the left atrium. So this is a, um, a circulation in parallel. And so these babies are dying the minute they're born. So it's not atypical to have a patient like this come into the cath lab with a pH of 6.5 um, and actively becoming bradycardic as they get close to cardiac arrest. So what do we do? What do we need to do to actually fix the situation? Anybody know? Very good, atrial subtostomy. So the Rashkin atrial subtostomy um, is creating a hole between the right atrium and the left atrium because what we wanna do is we wanna allow mixing so that we actually have purple blood going to both circulations as opposed to having blue blood going to the blue blood circulation, red blood going to the red blood circulation, right? So the idea is what we do is we can either go from the umbilical vein or we can go from the femoral vein, cross the PFO, because right, every baby has a PFO at this point, inflate a balloon in the left atrium and pull it back through the atrial septum. And what that does is tears a hole in the atrial septum and creates a um, continu continuity between the right atrium and the left atrium. That allows mixing, so you have purple blood going to the aorta so that you get some degree of oxygenation going to the systemic circulation. You have purple blood going to the lungs so you get some degree 
of gas exchange in the lungs, okay? And so this gets you through the first several hours, potentially for, through the first week, potentially through the first several years. But obviously that's not a solution. Now you all know the difference between the senning and the mustard, right? So the mustard, so senning and mustard, which one's made out of the atrial tissue? Very good, excellent, all right, good retention. All right, so the idea is that you're gonna baffle the blue blood from the SVC and the IVC to the left atrium. The blue blood is gonna go through the left ventricle, get pumped through the pulmonary artery, go through the pulmonary circulation, become red, and then you're gonna baffle the pulmonary venous circulation, the red blood to the right atrium, right ventricle, which gets pumped to the systemic circulation through the aorta, and you, that's how you're gonna get oxygenation, right? So the problem is, from day one, you have a systemic right ventricle. Right, and the right ventricle was never meant to be hooked up to the aorta, right? So from day one, you're going to start to be prone towards heart failure. And so this is how it presents. So this is the patient that exposed me to transfusion for the very first time. He's a 28-year-old man who had the initial atrial switch procedure after his Rashkin, okay? And he was actually playing softball, running home from third base when he suddenly collapsed. He got bystander CPR until EMS arrived. He was found to be in VF, and he was defibrillated successfully. He ultimately actually walked out of the hospital after getting an IC a week later. Obviously, he had no coronary disease. So when I first <laughs> got asked to see this patient, I was asked to do a TEE on him in the CCU while he was intubated. I had absolutely not, no idea what was connected to what, nor what was going on with these things that were connecting the SVC and IVC to whatever, okay? So that's, that's how I got involved. So the bottom line is this, right? This is a systemic right ventricle. These patients are gonna develop heart failure, especially if they start developing tricuspid regurgitation, right? Because then you're gonna have a situation where you have a systemic right ventricle that's subject to pressure overload as well as volume overload. So once we start seeing um, regurgitation more than moderate in the tricuspid, that's a situation where these patients can go down very quickly. Atrial arrhythmias have to be taken very seriously because if they have a mustard baffle, that the atrial arrhythmias can really put them into a bad situation with poor cardiac output, okay? The other issue that we've seen is that atrial arrhythmias can actually degenerate into ventricular uh, arrhythmias and then sudden death. And so that may or may not have been what happened to this patient. So uh, sometime in the 80s um, uh, and 90s, uh, surgeons started doing the arterial switch instead. And so the arterial switch involves the following. It's basically what it sounds like. You're gonna take the pulmonary artery and bring it forward, and you're gonna take the aorta and you're gonna take it backwards. But of course, the issue that you have to do at the end of the day is you have to move the coronary arteries, right? So as you can see here, if you don't do that, you're gonna have the pulmonary uh, arterial circulation connected to the pulmonary arteries, which means that you're gonna have to reimplant the coronary arteries, as I mentioned at the very beginning, into the neo-aorta. But remember, the neo-aorta is actually the pulmonic tissue and then of course the coronaries are reimplanted. So the typical issue that you're gonna see with these patients is the following. Number one, you're gonna have coronary arterial kinking, okay, and potentially cardiomyopathies in these patients. The other issue is of course, you're gonna stretch the pulmonary artery forward so you can actually develop pulmonary arterial stenosis either in the branch PAs or even in the main PA and you can have supervalvar PS. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you can also develop neoaortic dilation and regurgitation. So all these patients continue to be followed, even though for a very long time we thought that this was quote unquote the cure for detransposition of the great arteries. And so what this means if you, is if you see a patient in their 20s with transposition of the great arteries, this is probably what they have, and you probably need to take ST changes on their EKG very seriously if you see them in the emergency room. And that's where they're gonna show up. They're gonna show up in the emergency room. So, um, I wanna just take one quick moment and then we'll end um, to talk about complex versus simple transposition of the great arteries because this is something that for some reason we never get around to talking about. So transposition of the great arteries with the ventricular septal defect is, is typically what we say is sort of where we go to complex uh, transposition of the great arteries. And actually what's interesting about this is you can actually do, um, you can actually do what's called a Rastelli repair, which is if the VSD is close enough to the outflow tracks, you can actually close the VSD and actually allow sort of a physiologic repair, uh, I'm sorry, an anatomic repair where you actually can put an RVDPA conduit in and have the left ventricle remain as a systemic ventricle, okay? So that may actually solve some of the problems that we talked about with having a systemic right ventricle. But you trade that for the second tissue, which at the end of the day is that you have now an RVDPA conduit, which is typically a home graft, and that will fail which means that uh, sooner or later, this patient's probably going to need some sort of intervention to that RVP uh, conduit. So anyway, so I'll, I'll stop at that. Um, I won't subject you guys to any more of the questions, but if you have any questions now, I'd be happy to answer them.
Gaza. How, how come in today our uh, how come in today our Polonic annulus uh, sparing uh, repairs for TET patients? Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting question. So um, I think many surgeons strive for that. Um, I, so so for, for those of you who don't know what he's asking, sometimes you can try to preserve the pulmonic valve, okay? And I think most surgeons try to do something in the current era to make sure that they can do the best job that they can with the pulmonic valve without just completely destroying it. Um, I think the problem is what we see 10, 15 years down the line, right? Because we don't really realize the effects of that for, you know, until they get to early adulthood or late teenage years. Um, so I think m many surgeons are trying. Um, I think whether or not it's actually going to work, I think is a different question. And honestly, to, in my own sort of anecdotal experience, I think what we've seen um, is in those quote unquote valve sparing repairs, they re-stenosis. And what that ends up meaning is that we end up having to stent it <laughs> put in a transcatheter pulmonary valve in there. So I think it does save them potentially in some of these patients an open heart surgery because um, they can go to straight to transcatheter valve. Um, so I don't know, jury's still out on that one, I think. Dr. Q. Do all systemic RVs destined to heart failure when they become adults or do some do better than others? For example, kids that are born with corrected transposition, yeah. so they are physiologically corrected and the RV has been systemic since they were in, in, in uterine. Yeah. Do they do better? Yeah. Or does the RV always goes bad once you hit no. 40 or 50 years or whatever? That's, that's a really hard question, right? So I think most of us probably have some sort of anecdotal experience where we have like an 80-year-old L transposition in the great arteries patient who shows up and whoops, we just suddenly realize, hey, actually that AV valve on the left side is really apical and it looks a lot like a tricuspid valve. Um, and you know, they're completely asymptomatic, literally asymptomatic, they don't even have complete heart block, right? So they, they sort of break the mold. I think most of us have actually had one of those in our, in our panel at some point in time. So I think the problem with this is under detection of L transposition in the great arteries, right? So I think you're not gonna detect it until they're symptomatic. And so I think we have a little bit of a selection bias for those patients who are sicker. So my suspicion is that systemic right ventricle alone is probably not enough to get you into trouble, right, despite everything that I said. But I think it's still a spectrum as well. I think, you know, what we don't see is we don't see the L-transpositions who are sick as neonates, because that definitely happens as well. We have, I mean, there are patients who are just completely in trouble um, as, um, as children. So. Um, and we just don't see them because we see them as repaired once they get to adulthood and they see, we see issues there. So I think it's a very, very wide spectrum that I think as we get better with our imaging and we do more imaging because that's probably what's going to keep happening, I think we'll get a better sense of what the true prevalence of L transposition is and probably get a better sense of what the answer is to your question. But in the meantime, I think it's underdiagnosed and underdetected and maybe we can't really answer that just yet. Hard to say. So, um, as you know, there are abnormalities with the way the AV node forms um, in L transposition patients. And so they are subject to complete heart block as well as other potential conduction abnormalities. Um, and so they, you know, they just, just like when you operate around the atria for the atrial baffle, um, atrial switch procedures, they are subject to heart block as well and requirement of a pacemaker. I think. Um, I think most people believe that mustard patients, so atrial switch detransposition patients using bovine pericardium are probably still subject to more atrial arrhythmias. I don't know that we have data for sure to prove that um, in multicenter studies, um, but I suspect that that's probably going to be the case. Then the second is going to be the setting patient, and then I think the third is going to be the L, um, L transposition patient. I don't know that I have real data to support that, but I think that's sort of the, the general feeling. Peter, did you have a question? Yeah. Patient shows up to the ER, and I haven't seen a doc in 18 years, and they, they said I had a surgery as a kid or a baby, and you don't know what they have, and you get an echo, and maybe you can't tell from the echo. What's your next preferred imaging modality? Usually I don't have to deal with it because they, they've already gotten a CTA to rule out PE. Okay. So, so there is inval those are invaluable. Okay, so, so those of you who round with me on the congenital service, you'll see when I have that issue, that's the first thing that I go to. Okay, even before I go to the echo, because you can get tons of information from the cross-sectional imaging, especially if they time it wrong, right? And they get some left-sided um, uh, opacification, you can get plenty of data. One of the things that you will see is because they're shooting from the upper extremities, 
you'll see that they're single ventricle really quick, right? So you get zero opacification of maybe one lung because the gland preferentially flows to the right lung, okay? And then that's how you can put together the data really quickly, okay? Great question. All right, oh, okay, one more question, but we're sort of running out of time. Go ahead. with tetralogy, if there is an anomalous origin of the lady from the right sinus going across the RVOT, what do they do? Like, because they can do the patch drift at that time. Well, so they can. It sort of depends on where it is and whether or not they can mobilize the coronary artery. Um, so I, I think most people will still continue to try to do the best that they can with that. It all sort of depends. I think they, that's where, um, Thank goodness, in kids, you can actually image the coronary arteries really well by echo, because typically that's all you get um, going into the operating room. So I think the surgeons, and again, this is probably a better question for a surgeon than for me, but they, um, depending on the location of the vessel, whether or not they can mobilize the coronary, um, they will try. Um, I think the answer to your question is if they cannot, then of course that's where you put an RVDK conduit of some kind, and typically a homograph is, is the situation. Oh. What are the geographical trends in the ACHD population? Wow, that's a really tough question. I think that there are two things that influence that, um, and the real answer to that is I don't think anybody actually knows the answer to that. But I, um, if you were to you know, ask me to come up with a hypothesis, I think a lot of it has to do with where um, the majority or the high volume centers were for um, pediatric surgery, right? So you know, we take it for granted now that you can actually pick up and go somewhere if you wanna have surgery. Right, so if I wanted to have my child have some sort of cardiac surgery at Boston Children's, we'd just go there, okay? That was not the case 30, 40, 50 years ago, right? So 30, 40, 50 years ago, flights weren't that simple to get. And if you really wanted to do that, and kids actually had to stay in the hospital for several months, definitely 40, 50 years ago, right? So if you wanted your kid to survive, a lot of them actually had to, the family had to pick up and actually relocate. So we actually have a number of families who have picked up and relocated um, way back in the 50s and 60s to this area in order for, say, Denton Cooley to operate on their child um, for their initial palliation. And that's why we probably, as well as places like Boston, Minnesota, um, uh, uh, Baltimore, uh, Philadelphia, um, Los Angeles, et cetera, and a bunch of other places I can't name at this point in time, have probably more adults with congenital heart disease than other places in the country. And that's because they're surgical centers um, from 40, 50 years ago. So. All right, thank you guys, appreciate it.